The Foreign Minister of Nicaragua, Denis Moncada, addressed on national television the interventionist acts of the Organization of American States and Minawa's official exit of the organization. The judicial branch in Peru has sentenced former presidential advisor Vladimiro Montesinos to 17 years in prison for the kidnapping of journalist Gustavo Gorriti and others during Alberto Fujimori's mandate. In India, Prime Minister Narendra Mari announced on Friday that the controversial agricultural laws approved last year will be overruled. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. The Foreign Minister of Nicaragua, Denis Moncada, addressed on national television the interventionist acts of Organization of American States and Menewa's official exit of the organization. Foreign Affairs Executive Denis Moncada announced the official leave of Nicaragua from the OAS, a decision ratified by the Supreme Court of the Central American country. As the OAS Executive Chair, Luis Almagro, and the government of the United States use the organization's charter to coerce other nations to their own interest, advised the minister Nicaragua chooses to follow its democratic path without the pressures of foreign influences. Denis Moncada reassured that the electoral process in Nicaragua was carried out lawfully and peacefully and that the high offices of the OAS abused their authority to act in the name of other countries' interests. Pueblo nicaragüense, con instrucción del compañero presidente de la República, comandante Daniel Ortega Saavedra, comunicamos a ustedes, al pueblo de Nicaragua y a la comunidad internacional, que hoy viernes 19 de noviembre a las 8 de la mañana, enviamos al Secretario General de la Organización de los Estados Americanos. Ecuador's President Guillermo Lasso extended by 30 days the country's state of emergency declared on October 18th in nine of the Ecuadorian provinces. The presidency stated that the purpose of this declaration is to protect the rights of the people and to control the insecurities that have arisen linked to drug trafficking, as well as to restore peaceful coexistence and public order. Of the 24 provinces of Ecuador, the head of state decided to renew the state of emergency in nine of them. El Oro, Guayas, Santa Elena, Manabí, Los Rios, Esmeraldas, Santo Domingo de los Chasilas, Pichincha, and Sucumbios. On the basis of this measure, the Federal Armed Forces and the State Police are authorized, among other things, to carry out gang controls, inspections, patrols around the clock, and drug seizures. And the debate in Colombia for the total decriminalization of abortion, on which the Constitutional Court expected to make a substantive determination on Thursday, continues without being resolved. The plenary chamber had to decide whether to maintain or separate from the discussion one of the nine magistrates in charge of issuing the ruling, but the vote was tied. With four votes in favor and four against, the tiebreaker has now been left to the assistant judge Hernando Yepes Arcila, who will have to decide whether the magistrate Alexander Linares will continue to be part of the conjunctural discussions on the voluntary interruption of pregnancy. According to sources close to the Constitutional Court, his decision could take a week or two. The discussion around Linares came after a challenge presented to the plenary chamber by lawyer Ana Maria Hidarrega in the framework of some statements from the magistrate on which she accuses him of publicly expressing his position on the issue of abortion. Because of the challenge, Linares himself declared disabled this week to participate in the debate and left it up to his colleagues to assess whether they accept or this his impediment or not.
Now we continue. The campaign in silence on the electoral process in Venezuela began this Friday ahead of the regional elections to be held on November 21st. Our correspondent Brian Muir has more details for us about the preparations for this event. Regional election campaign season ended at midnight last night and there's an air of calm over the city of Caracas as the military delivers the voting machines to over 14,000 voting centers across the country. Now this year in the elections, which will take place Sunday, there's 3,082 positions open and there's over 70,000 candidates, 96% of which are from opposition parties to the ruling PSUV of President Nicolas Maduro. Now candidates are running for 23 governor positions, 335 mayor's offices, over 200 local legislators at state level and around 335 mayors. As international election observers continue to arrive in the city from over 55 countries, the United States government has issued a preemptive statement refusing to recognize the elections as free and fair. This is ironic coming from a country that's seen it two of its last four presidents take power after losing the popular vote amid rampant accusations of illegal voter suppression of African Americans. Nevertheless, Venezuela's foreign affairs minister, Felix Plasencia, urged the United States to stop meddling in Venezuelan affairs and recognize its sovereignty and the will of the Venezuelan electorate with over 21 million registered voters in a process in which the European Union has sent 100 election observers to the country for the first time since 2006 and is refusing to make any official statement about the credibility of the elections until they're done actually observing them. Thank you, Brian, for your report. And now we continue. Other elections to be held in South America are the ones in Chile. This Thursday concluded the campaign events ahead of the general elections with an aggressive closing rally by the far right in which they paid homage to former dictator Augusto Pinochet. The campaign silence on the electoral process began this Friday and will last until Sunday, when the first round will take place in an event that for many is the most polarized presidential election in the country's history. The closing ceremonies of each of the seven candidates have been in tune with the political moment that Chile is living. Where, where there were massive rallies, small events in squares and towns, and even an early morning planting of paper mills in that was the epicenter of the 2019 protest. The candidates leading the polls come from different backgrounds in the political spectrum. Jose Antonio Cast on the far right and Gabriel Boric, the country's youngest ever presidential challenger to the left. They are competing against five other candidates and will surely see each other again for the second round on December 19th. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back. The judicial branch in Peru has sentenced former presidential advisor Vladimiro Montesinos to 17 years in prison for the kidnapping of journalist Gustavo Gorriri and others, which occurred in 1992 after the coup perpetrated by former president Alberto Fujimori. Similarly, retired General José Rolando Valdivia Dueñas was sentenced to 12 years in prison, as well as former generals Julio Salazar Monroe and Alfredo Arnaiz Ambrosiani, to 10 years in prison after being recognized as primary accomplices in the crime. As preparation and reparation, the court ordered the payment of $137,000 that will have to be paid to Gurori and the other defended citizens. Montesinos is serving sentences for crimes of corruption of officials, usurpation of public office, money laundering, kidnapping, conspiracy, arms trafficking, aggravated homicide and enforced disappearance.
This Thursday, a request made by a group of Bolivian lawyers against Romulo Galbo, the president of the Pro Santa Cruz Committee, revealed that the leader, who has also been accused of participating in the 2019 coup and in recent acts of violence, has 35 legal processes. Lawyers promoting the trial against Romulo Galbo state that they will take him to court as they have information on his possible escape and will therefore request an arrest warrant. They also state that they are trying to avoid a new coup escalation in Bolivia. Romulo Horta has promoted the indefinitive multisexual strike in Santa Cruz. And in 2019, during the coup d'etat, he was one of the most violent and belligerent actors, including racist instructions, so that supporters of Evo Morales will be attacked. The Bolivian Minister of Justice, Ivan Lima, confirmed that the civic leader has 35 lawsuits, several of them filed by the former mayor of Santa Cruz, Percy Fernandez, a former ally of Calvo. This former mayor of Santa Cruz, this former councilman, has more than 35 processes. There are many corruption scandals in which he is involved, not presented by the socialist movements, but by the former mayor of Santa Cruz, Percy Fernandez, some of them with accusations. The Minister of Government, Eduardo del Castillo, responded to the accusations of supporters of the leader who claimed that the executive branch is allegedly persecuting Calvo. The official reminded them that Janine Añez was no longer in the government and her practices were not being maintained either. In November 2019, we are no longer leaving the 2020 administration. Mr. Añez does not govern here and there is no political persecution in our country. Here, there is a government democratically elected by all the Bolivian people with more than 55 percent. We have always guaranteed the right to protest and freedom of expression of each and every Bolivian citizen. However, we will not tolerate the crimes that are committed in our country. There have been some people who have allegedly committed crimes promoted by Mr. Romulo Calvo by doing actions or by different omissions. We are analyzing each of these facts the actions taken by Mr. Calvo during the days of a civic strike that has generated damage to all Bolivian families, and we will see what his actions have been. If we find some elements for the commission of alleged crimes, the Ministry of Government will be present in the corresponding processes. Former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva had another victory in the Brazilian courts following the decision of a Sao Paulo court to close the investigation against three of his sons. On Thursday, the Justice Court of Sao Paulo accepted the request of the Paulo Prosecutor's Office and ended the investigation against three of the sons of the former president, Fabio Luis, Marcos Claudio, and Sandra Luis Lula da Silva. Given the complete lack of evidence, the magistrate annulled the investigation that searched for links between Lula's relatives and the Lava Hato case. Da Silva remained in prison for 580 days until his release in March this year, when a federal Supreme Court judge overturned his conviction and allowed him to run for the presidency in 2022. On Thursday, the government of the Russian Federation delivered to the Cuban people a donation of 672 tons of vegetable oil through the United Nations Organization's World Food Program. The ambassador of the Russian nation to the island, Andrei Gossok, pointed out that this action responds to the ties of friendship that have united both countries for many years. The head of the World Food Program in the Caribbean nation, Paolo Matei, informed that the donation will benefit more than 70,000 elderly people through the family care system. Also, Deborah Rivas, the Vice Minister of Foreign Trade and Foreign Investment, also thanked Russia for its support and confirmed that the oil will be distributed free of charge. Now we move on to other topics. In Europe, this Monday, Austria returns to general confinement and decreased a mandatory vaccination against COVID-19 for the whole nation due to the increase of cases in the whole region. 
Health authorities informed that compulsory vaccination will start from February 2022 for all the residents of the country. They pointed out that they have been forced to take action on COVID-19 as the infection rate is among the highest on the continent. Alexander Schallenberg, federal chancellor, considers that citizens will have to go through new restrictions due to people's unawareness that has asked to reduce contact and follow the measures stipulated. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. So stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced on Friday that the controversial agricultural laws approved last year will be overruled. These laws they were met with refusal by many farmers, seeing the legislation threaten their livelihood. People celebrated in the streets of India what they regard as a win for the workers of the land, who for a year stood their ground against the laws that sought to put in private hands the fate of the Indian agriculture. The Premier acknowledged that he could not convince a large sector of farmers and the rural workers of the benefits of the laws and consider his government as a failure. Some analysts, surprised by the Premier's decision, especially given his majority support in the Parliament, assured that the scheduled protests and the proximity of the regional elections could have favored the farmers with leverage. The constitutional abrogation of the three laws will finish by the end of the month. The Syrian government denounced on Thursday that the situation of displaced people and refugees is still a national priority and that they work with Russia to guarantee the return of their citizens. In a statement, Syria ratified its collaboration with Russia. Damascus thanked Moscow for sharing efforts in the initiative that seeks to aid displaced people in returning home. In the document, the state expressed to continue working on re-establishing security and infrastructure, as well as denounced the actions of the West, the most recurrent of which is to inject mass sums of credit into local terrorist groups, situation that endangers the return of Syrian citizens who were forced out of their homes due to the ongoing conflict. And right at this hour, we move on to the northeast of the Spain, since during this Friday morning, there were very tense hours at the airport of Alvedro, due to a bomb warning on a plane coming from Bilbao. The civil guards confirmed after a rigorous search of the plane that no suspicious device had been located on the third the Valoria fly covering the route Bilbao to La Coruña. At 7.25 a.m. local time, 105 passengers were evacuated after a bomb warning was received on the aircraft. The airport authorities confirmed that all passengers are safe and had been isolated without their luggage, according to the protocols for these cases. The Basque police force received the anonymous message, but at this hour, the civil guard has already declared that the alarm was false. Some national media have reported that a person has been arrested, although no official institution confirms it. Ethiopian lawmakers appointed a committee to investigate the alleged mass arrest carried out under the new wartime state of emergency. The move comes after allegations of arbitrary arrest of ethnic Tigrayans as the Tigray People's Liberation Front and allied rebel groups continue their advance towards the capital Addis Ababa, sparking the announcement of emergency measures by the government. Meanwhile, top diplomats from the African Union and the United States returned to Ethiopia on Thursday as part of a ramp-up effort to broker a ceasefire in the country's north. The African Union's Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Olusengu Nabazanjo, and his United States counterpart, Jeffrey Folman, had already visited the country earlier this month in a bid to facilitate a deal to end the grueling year-long war between Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's government and the TPLF. In a briefing with journalists, the spokesperson of Ethiopia's foreign ministry commented on the visits by mediators from the African Union, the United States, and the Kenyan president, Uhuru Kenyatta. Various forces, actually, it was uh, a kind of investigation. He was investigating situations. It's uh, 
a fact-finding type of mission. He, he went to Tigray, he, went, he came to Addis, he went to neighboring countries as well, he went to the U.S. I think he's investigating things. He's looking, in, talking to different partners, and uh, at the end of the day, he'll come out with a proposal. And that proposal is not yet obvious. We'll see what this proposal will be. And uh, the same thing holds true for uh, Mr. Feldman. Well, Kenya, role, Kenya is a new neighboring country, and uh, any neighboring country will have a concern about its neighbor. And out of the concern, the leader could have come here. But basically, he, his, his mission is also to talk about bilateral issues, about strengthening relationship between uh, our two countries. And in fact, uh, his concern is as well. Hopefully. The government of Niger described two armed attacks near the border with Mali that killed 25 civilians and caused extensive material damage as acts of terrorism. The Interior Ministry reported that the attacks were perpetrated on Tuesday in the Baccarat camp and the capital of the commune of Tiboram, located respectively in the departments of Tilia and Tahua, by an identified armed man. The Baccarat attack resulted in 25 dead, one injured, and two vehicles burned, while that in Tiboram saw infrastructure set on fire or ransacked, including the headquarters of the town hall, the integrated health center, and the electrical installations, as well as two money transfer agencies. Both areas are located in northern Niger and near the Malian border, and have been the subject of the recurrent attacks attributed to terrorist groups operating in northern Mali since 2017. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesuityenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesuity English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.